All right, we're here on the Trent Acid Tribute Radio Show, and on the line with me, I have Trent's tag team partner, Johnny Cashmere, on the line. Johnny, how are you doing? Hey, guys, thanks for having me. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing better. Uh, it was tough on me. It was tough on everybody. Uh, you know, it was one of those things that uh, you just can't prepare for it. You know, even though you, you see someone on a path that you know can't be good, you know, you still hit shit, just, oh, man, you know, I'm still not back to my routine. Uh, I bet you actually, time. yeah, as we speak right now, I am on the Acid Fest um, Facebook page, and I'm inviting people right now, so every time I invite people, then I invite, like, uh, six, seven, eight hundred people, <laughs> and then something happens where... Uh, I forget to hit send, and then I lose it all. It happened twice already in a row. Oh, okay. damn. You know, I'm sending, like, every 30 or 40 people. Yeah. So I'm going to take a take a break from this right now so I can give you my attention. Uh, no. I do appreciate you guys doing this show. No problem. You know, and I want to uh, take time out to thank you for coming on. My uh, first question for you is, you know, being you were around Trent for so long, what do you think Trent wants his fans to remember most for? Um, his passion. I mean, I know that's cliche, and a lot of people say the passion, the passion, the passion. It's uh, overused, more overused than, you know, the DDT nowadays. <laughs> and I think Trent really did have that. Uh, I think I, I almost feel bad for Trent that so many people use the term passion because it waters it down, and then it doesn't mean as much when you say it for someone like Trent, but... Trent was one of those guys who would go out there, and even if there was eight people in the crowd, he'd put on a great match, you know. Uh, he would still work his hardest. Um, he would get more out of his opponents than anyone else would ever get out of his opponents. And what happened was people would want to work Trent. It was like there was like a line of people who wanted to work Trent. And I've heard so many people now that he's gone, oh, man, I really wanted to have worked him. And, and it's funny. I think to myself, you know, on, the, on a level, they are being genuine, and, and it's flattering. But on another level, it's, it's almost selfish because they know that Trent is going to pull something out of them that they can't pull out of themselves in a match. Hmm. And they wanted to work them because you grow when, when that happens. You evolve as a wrestler. So people wanted to wrestle Trent because, you know, you learn from wrestling people better than you. I mean, you can learn from wrestling people worse than you, but it's more like a what not to do type thing. But right. when you wrestle someone like Trent, um, you know how they say people can some people can wrestle a broomstick and it will be a good match. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, like Trent is that. You know, then people have said that he has the Shawn Michaels gift, the Shawn Michaels gene, the hmm. show stealing quality, and I think that is probably the legacy you want is is the indie. Shawn Michaels is what he was. Yeah, in he, my opinion. He was definitely over. I mean, over, definitely. But when I say the indie Shawn Michaels, I mean more than just fan reaction. Of course, he had the crowd reaction. Um, but he was the kind of guy that would give you a main event match no matter where he was on the show. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of guy that you almost had to put near the end of the show because people couldn't follow his matches is what was happening. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally understand. So when I say Shawn Michaels, I mean the show stealing gene. The ability to go out there and have match of the night with various different wrestlers. I mean, you know, Michaels had match of the night with Vader and, you know, people that were never having match of the night. Uh Acid did that. You know, a lot of people you say to them, What was your favorite match? they're gonna tell you it was either against Trent Acid or against the Backseat Boys. And you're gonna hear that from a lot of people. Now, speaking of the Backseat Boys, you guys have been, or you've been posting on your Facebook, uh, you know, a lot of pictures and videos of you with Trent and Trent with fans. What of those matches with Trent sticks out to you the most? <laughs> Probably the thing we did, the skit we did on WWE um, back in the day, it was 2001, Easter Sunday, when WWF still had their... Uh, Times Square, New York Cafe. And it was, uh, we had gotten a phone call around, geez, noon from Dave Sapolsky had called Trent and said, you know, can you guys be up there in like three hours? And that's about how long it takes to make the drive. 
<laughs> and we went up there, and they had us uh, be the backseat Dudleys. And Paul Heyman was working in the back with Taz and Michael Cole, and Albert was there, and we did a whole angle with Albert, and you can see it all on YouTube. It's on uh, my Facebook. You just search Johnny Cashmere. You'll find my Facebook. Um, and it's right on there. You just look on the wall. But I think that and probably our matches against Rick Blade and Nick Mondo and CZW. Um, CZW was still a, a new company, Future Uncertain, and they had the hardcore edge, uh, but they didn't have the wrestling. And when me and Trent wrestled Blade and Mondo in our series of matches, suddenly CZW had the wrestling. And it brought us a whole new volume of fans, a whole new... Uh, a whole new uh, like tier of, of fans showed up. Now, now you had the hardcore fans, and you had the smart marks, and that that's really what what CZW relied on back in the day. And it was matches like me and Trent versus Blade and Mondo that really set the stage and the foundation. It was like, okay, locker room, top that. <laughs> so then it was like next month, everyone tried to top it, and if someone did, then it was okay, great. Now we have to top that next month. And that's really the game we played for, for years. Now, if you were to write a book about Trent's life, what would the title be? Oh, my goodness. Um, the title of a book about Trent's life would be, um, I mean, I guess, I guess Sinatra has I did it my way, so we couldn't do that. But it would have to be something like that. It would have to be something like... Uh, you know, uh, I don't know, jumping, humping, and, you know, pumping the Trent Acid story or something, you know. <laughs> I don't know. It would have to be something along the lines of, uh, it would have to capture his larger-than-life personality, uh, his, his sense of humor. Uh, definitely a ladies' man. To, uh, to put into perspective for you <laughs> how much of a ladies' man he is, you know, the, the average guy on the street might be out, you know, fishing with a fishing pole, uh, while Trent's in the boat, you know, with his arms open and the fish are just jumping into the boat. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's the difference, you know. So it's something that encompasses all that, plus his wrestling. I'd have to think about that. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that if I was writing his biography, that would probably take me eight or nine months to come up with the answer. <laughs> and I would probably be woken out of a sound sleep a few times with ideas. And that would be a big thing. I, I'd obsess on that. Now, my co-host, uh, Missionary, has a couple questions for you. So, Missionary, go ahead. Yeah, hey, Johnny. I wanted to know, um, <clears throat> in your opinion, what was Trent Acid's crowning achievement in his career? Well, I guess his crowning achievement in his career was when he had the Big Japan Junior Heavyweight title, and uh, he had won it. Uh, well, he actually, let me think here, how did this go? Him and I had a match. In, uh, it wasn't Corrigan Hall. It was Yokohama Arena in Japan. Mm -hmm. It was me and him against Men's Teo and Jun Kasai. Me and him won the tag belts in that match and the junior belt. I became Big Japan Junior Champion. He became CZW Junior Champion. And then I lost the belt to Ruckus. Ruckus lost the belt to Trent. Trent ends up in America defending that title. So I think his being the big Japan junior heavyweight champion and having the belt and having it in America for as long as he did. Um, I think that was probably his crowning achievement is, is off the top of my head as, as well as he, he had a dark match in right. WWE. So those two things. Um, what do you think Trent's biggest goal in life was? I think he wanted a, a TV contract. I think he wanted to, to get on television, you know, to be like a, a Brian Danielson or a, a Evan Bourne to be on TV and to have a chance for America to either fall in love with him or cast him aside. I think that he looked at it as, as in his mind, he thought, regardless of what the brass think, regardless of what a Vince McMahon or, you know, a Laurinaitis or any, any of the guys in the back might think. Right. I know if I can get out in front of that crowd that I can endear myself and that America will want to see more of me. He's confident about that. He knew that. He used to say that. And I think that if he would have been given that opportunity, and I'm not saying I fault WWE, and there was no conspiracy. It, you know, we never reached out. 
you know, everyone that got signed sent something to the Fed. They did something. I mean, we, we just expected, oh, we'll just be good enough. And we'll just shine bright enough that they can't ignore us. And <laughs> it doesn't work that way, you know? Yeah. So had we reached out to the Fed back then, do I think we would have got something? Yeah, I think we would have. I think we could have had developmental, or we could have at least had uh, more dark matches, at the very least. Right. Um, if it wasn't for, you know, Rob Feinstein and Gabe Sapolsky having the connection and just saying, like, well, let's send Johnny and Trent, you know, we know they'll make us look good. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have even had what we had. It was their whim, so to speak. I got you. You know, if they had just got off, if they had just got off the phone with a different wrestler and that person was on their mind, they may have given it to them. But we were on their mind at that time and they gave it to us. And we've always been thankful and appreciative for that. Now, um, who was Trent Acid's hero and inspiration in life? I guess Eddie Vedder. It's funny, Trent always was a big Pearl Jam fan. Huge Pearl Jam fan. And one of the crowning moments in his life outside of wrestling was when he went to a Pearl Jam concert and Eddie Vedder has this thing where he had opened up, I guess, a, a bottle of wine. Like a bottle of wine mm -hmm. or a uh, it might have been alcohol, I don't know. And he let Trent drink it, like pulled Trent. I don't know if he pulled him up on the stage or if he just sort of bent down and let Trent take a swig and handed him the bottle and Trent handed it back. And I guess they got the high five. And, you know, Trent said he couldn't sleep that night. It was, you know, the biggest night of his life. And I know Nick Burke was there in the audience to see it. Hmm. And uh, I know that was big. And, and it's funny because I always sort of modeled my look after Chris Cornell from Soundgarden, and he kind of always modeled his look he being Trent after Eddie Vedder and Eddie Vedder and Chris Cornell used to be Temple of the Dog. They broke up and they each had one of the most successful bands of all times. Right. So I'm kind of hoping that, you know, the backseat boys have now spawned vanilla man candy, which is a tribute. It's, it's a tribute band to the backseat boys is what it is. It's a, it is, it's its own entity. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it's also uh, a tribute to Trent acid and it's myself and Matt Walsh. And we're going to add a few more members. Um, well, I mean, me and me and, and Walsh are vanilla man candy, but we're going to add a few more members that when we're all together, we're kind of like, you know, Acid Angels or Acid Avengers or whatever. Yeah. I'm sure we won't think of, we'll think of something less lame, but you know what I mean. Um, but we're going to try to get a stable together to honor Trent um, with his students and, you know, people that he helped in the business so that he can sort of, uh, his name can live on. You know what I mean? Like his grandkids in the business, so to speak, or right. kids. People inspired by him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What's the one thing about Trent or Michael Verdi you'll miss? <laughs> the one thing. Uh, me and him both had very messed up sleep schedules our whole life. And I, he was the one person that I knew if I woke up and it was 3 in the morning, I could call him. If I woke up and it was 7 in the morning, I could call him. And even if he wasn't awake, he would just say, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, I was awake, I was awake, and he'll pretend he was. And you could still talk, you know, he, he just never slept. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, he slept, but not the way, like, I might sleep, you know, nine hours at a time. He would sleep five hours here, four hours there, maybe. You know, it's different. Right. So I miss that about him. Uh, his laugh, you know, he lit up a room when he laughed. If you didn't know him, you, who was that kid with that laugh? And, you know, he couldn't hate him. No one hated him. There was no one that, that felt like they were his acquaintance. Everyone is either his friend or they didn't know him at all. But I, I've never heard anyone say, I don't like Trent or I dislike him or I hate him. I've never heard that come out of people's mouths, right. which is interesting because you know, he's as Italian as I am. <laughs> and he can be as spiteful and as stubborn as I can. And he just doesn't have the, the rub people the wrong way gene. 